The COAP trial was a trial that has been attempted many times before, but rarely with this level of success. And the goal was to look at functional mitral regurgitation in patients with most often lower ejection fractions and divide them into two groups, one with guideline-directed medical therapy with a heart failure specialist involved, and then on the other side, look at guideline-directed medical therapy plus the mitral clip. Obviously, the patients had moderate to severe or severe mitral regurgitation, so that's one aspect to it. The second aspect is that these patients were considered non-operative SDS of 8% or higher, or they had a surgical high reason to be considered prohibitive risk in that manner. So that was the setup of the COAP trial. The patients have been followed for uh, at least two years, and the goal was to look at uh, heart failure hospitalizations, to look at mortality, and a whole sequence of secondary outcomes from both the anatomic as well as clinical perspective. So the findings were absolutely astounding, and I think the, the reason why this really stands out as a trial is that it shows for the first time that a therapy for mitral regurgitation can be both safe as well as effective for heart failure hospitalizations and also for mortality. This is groundbreaking from this realm for multiple different avenues. Number one, this shows that on top of guideline-directed medical therapy, and a mechanical solution is definitely worthwhile here. Number two, it also says that the repair option, and yes, this is a uh, you know, was affected by a learning curve. Yes, this was the first or the earlier generation of the mitral clip technology in which there's NTR, XTR, multiple size clips and other things available, and yet this was still successful. We have 3D echo and all those things now, and yet this was still successful. The third thing that we also know is that this is something that also will open up the transcatheter mitral valve repair and replacement space. For about a year and change, everybody has been waiting with bated breath as to what to do here for these patients, waiting for COAP to finish. If COAP was negative, then this would have been a very big pause on the whole field of us moving forward. I think that one of the biggest things, people thought that there would be some marginal benefit to heart failure hospitalizations. Very few people had the inkling that this would give a heart, the mortality benefit the way that it did. And I think that is one of the key aspects to this point is that there are so much of the mortality is also potentially dependent on the mitral regurgitation and even getting that to be improved. There's going to be, of course, some analyses and subgroups that are going to be evaluated for this, but this was one of the biggest take-home points of this trial. And the other thing that I would say is that personally having taken care of these patients or having many of these patients in the practice, we also know that degenerative MR is a small portion of the overall mitral regurgitation population. Any time that you can either take care of patients safer, take care of patients effectively, or treat more patients, it's a win, and this seems to have done all three of those. I think that's absolutely the question that multiple people have been asking, whether this is from the original makeup of the MITRA FR to the publication of the MITRA FR results to even now as of today. Some of the early insights into this were the uh, types of patients that were being evaluated were different in these groups. Some of the MITRA FR patients may have worse off ventricular uh, setup than what the uh, uh, COAP study had, part one. Part two is that was the heart failure standpoint differently managed. For example, in the COAP, they in the COAP trial, they had to have the guideline directed medical therapy up front. In the Mitra FR, they were allowed to have a lot more vary. They had a lot more variability after the clip was put in, which is more of a reflective of a real world population, but at the same time potentially speaks against optimization up front. And so these are two different potential explanations. The third thing I think, which is really key, is that. This shows that mitral clip is not a be-all, end-all at all stages. Just like we know, at certain stages of decompensated heart failure, some of the different drugs aren't going to work. Some of the different CRT, other mechanisms are not going to work. And sometimes there's a too early route. There has to be a sweet spot where this therapy is going to be successful. And I think that's what we learned today, is that there is this huge market for using this technology in the appropriate patients. Once the ventricle gets to a certain size, it doesn't matter what you do from the valve standpoint, it's not going to be effective. However, in this subgroup of, in this patient population, as was decided in, the, in this trial, the selection, inclusion, inclusion criteria, this did not only have a benefit, it had a substantial benefit. And I think that is going to be head and shoulders above the take home message from today is that within, this, within these parameters, if you are working in these parameters, you can do really well. What this is going to do is, I think in my mind, it's going to open up two different groups. One is a group of patients that are, did really, are, you know, are, are basically too sick for mitral clip. They have LVEDDs of eight, eight and a half. They have severe MR and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
and you also have the patients that are had a mitral clip but are still not doing great. What can you do for these patients? And that is going to be the next question of what sort of ventricular solution can you offer? And there are a few different therapies in this regard, and that is going to be part of the component. It's not just going to be a clip plus ring plus cord. It's going to be clip, ring, cord, ventricle replace. And all of that aspect has to play together depending on the level of disease that we have.